I seek God not because I find myself in thrall to religion, but because I feel myself in awe of reality. What is it all about? God, if there is a God, is one place I start. But what is God? I hear the word God all the time, but struggle with the concept of God. Theists and atheists debate whether God exists, but what God are they battling over? There's such enormous variation in the kinds of gods that populate human religions. I shiver with anxiety. What is God about? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. What kinds of gods do human religions have on offer? To begin, I scan the landscape, discover and dissect the divine varieties. I ask a Christian minister with a doctorate in physics known for defining careful categories of spiritual concepts. The founder of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, Robert John Russell. Bob, give me a sense of the landscape of, of how the best thinking today conceptualize God. You can think of God as entirely transcendent to the world, sort of so divine, so holy, so other that the only relation between God and the world is kind of like a tangent to a, a curve. Or you can begin to see God as both still transcendent, that is total mystery, ground of being, but yet in some ways present in the world in the processes of nature and history, so imminent in the world. God becomes so enmeshed in the world, so much a part of everything we see, that God and the world, in a sense, become the same. So you're in a, to use the traditional terms, we're moving from sort of classical theism to pantheism. Now in between, there's a third uh, movement that a lot of folks subscribe to. I wouldn't expect otherwise. <laughs> uh, you're right, <laughs> panentheism, uh, which attempts to say, look, uh, God is in the world, but the God is in the world is fully transcendent to the world. So in, in panentheism, you really emphasize both God's presence in the world, and yet the God who's, tr who's present is the God who's transcendent. What about the deist point of view, that God sort of created the world and then it went away and there's no relationship? Y yes, we can broaden the spectrum and include deism in the very limited sense of a God who creates the world and then the world's on its own. Now, most Christians and Jewish theologians won't, won't accept that because right. how could the world continue to exist without God as its creator? Creation isn't the, the giving of independent being to creation. The notion of creation is the constant dependence of the world on God. Why couldn't God be confident in his creation so much so that he could create it as such as to exist without his continual participation? To give creation so much self-existence would be in a certain sense to make it divine because God is the only conception which is self-existent. Deists today would be ones who would say God simply maintains the world in existence, or you might say that God enacts the world or enacts history, doesn't act in history. To bring in imminence means in some way God is somehow related to time, that when I pray that there's some interaction in that moment that is really unique and temporal and God really relates to it and God really responds in some way to it. So the temporal ask, act of God's relation to the world goes along with God's imminence to the world. So God really is in the present. In a certain sense, God doesn't know the future. And yet, in God's transcendence of the world by its creator, God knows the whole creation. And the challenge is then, can you hold those two concepts together? Does it disturb you or exhilarate you to see an overwhelming variety, a, uh, a, a blizzard mm -hmm. of different intellectual traditions? Mm -hmm. Is this a sign of human creativity as opposed to something that's, that's really existent? I think most theists would say the concept of God is of such an absolute mystery that the best we can get of it is a kind of partial understanding, and each of us is getting a different sort of parts. Yes, they seem in some ways incoherent together, but in some ways that's, that's the nature of human understanding of something like the divine. So I think the debates are healthy, but I, I'm not discouraged by the diversity of views, because in the end I think it reflects the overwhelming 
mystery of God. On the other hand, I don't want to say that all the differences aren't important because they do have different entailings in the way you live your life and therefore say you need to take those differences theologically seriously. Bob lays out the spectrum of kinds of gods. From God the transcendent, unknowable, unchangeable, unapproachable, to God the imminent, involved, active, affected, to God being identical to the world, pantheism. But what was that little surprise in the middle between transcendence and pantheism? Panentheism? The world being God, but God being more than the world? What's this, a Christian curveball? I squint a bit, then decide to follow this trail. I visit a leading panentheist, philosopher, theologian, Philip Clayton. Panentheism, briefly defined, is the notion that the world exists within the divine, though God is also more than the world. Pantheism would be that God is the divine, the world is God, God is the world, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship. Right. But panentheism holds there's a moment of transcendence. Something about the divine is more than the world. Okay, so let's now contrast panentheism and traditional theism. Traditional theism was based on a notion of substance. So you and I are individual substances, so are the chairs and the tables and trees. God is a highest substance. God exists outside the world and created this world outside of himself, if I can use the traditional male pronoun for this old-fashioned view. And then God sort of came to this world that he'd created and did things in it. I think that's a hard view to hold in light of contemporary science. We've understood that the world has these sorts of laws, and if there's a God sort of stepping in from time to time to rearrange the parts, that's unbeautiful. But how does panentheism then solve that problem? It makes the radical move of saying that natural regularities and natural forces are an expression of the divine. But why then do you even need a, a theistic part of that? Why don't you just have science? Just have the natural world be its own thing, self-existent in some way. And, and let's think about what we are as co conscious agents. We are more than the sum of our parts. We form intentions, and then we carry out those intentions. We have motivations, dreams, desires, imagination, rational visions. Right? And then we use those to carry out actions in the world. Why do we want to understand that God is less than that? Shouldn't the divine, this whole sum set of everything, also be able to be aware of the world as a whole? And in the moment that God is aware of the world as a whole, God is more than the world. How then can we begin to understand the nature of God in a panentheistic way? What are some of God's characteristics? Yeah. We would understand God as possessing some eternal properties that make God divine. Properties of, let's say, necessary being, of infinity, not finiteness, perhaps of moral perfection. That's a hard one for a natural theology, isn't it? On the other hand, if God is to be at all analogous to what we are as persons, God has to have a responsive pole or side of God's nature so that when people act in a certain way, then God can respond. Always responding to the world and always luring the world to its own higher potential. Hmm. Now that's a notion of God one could get behind. Well, I want to try to find truth, not what makes you comfortable. Now, I'm completely sympathetic with that um, criticism. It sounds silly, but I really feel that way. <laughs> but once we allow ourselves to engage in this sort of metaphysical reflection, what do we think about ultimate reality based on the best of what we know from our science and our own personal experience? I suggest that the most coherent, let's call it a guess, a hypothesis, a possibility, the most coherent possibility is this unifying view that we call panentheism. Panentheism challenges traditional Christianity which requires the all-powerful creator God to be totally independent of, to be totally outside of God's creation. Panentheism melds the world directly into God, yet maintains something of God external to the world. I like fresh thinking about God, 
though I'm hardly ready to be branded a panentheist. I also like Phil, but I don't let his rational, pleasant demeanor mask his radical, fascinating ideas. Another challenge to traditional Christianity is process theology, a novel way of thinking about God. I've never understood process theology. Okay, I've never really tried. Perhaps I should. So I visit a process theologian, the pioneer of the integration of science and religion, Ian Barber. Well, process philosophy derives mostly from Alfred North Whitehead, who was a philosopher at Harvard, had a great deal of influence on a number of theologians and philosophers. Uh, and he, he wants us to look at reality as a set of interdependent events, not substances, not little objects bumping into each other, but processes that are very dynamic, very interactive. He sees this in physics where you don't have just particles, but you have fields and, and a very fluid and dynamic uh, situation. And he also stresses that these uh, processes can be organized at different levels, but particularly he stresses there is both order and novelty. Events are not all determined, whether you go down to the quantum uncertainties way back at the bottom of things, or whether you talk about the emergence of new things in history. It's a way of looking at uh, reality that stresses temporality, becoming rather than being, events rather than substances, and then extends this to this more general analysis to include an understanding of God as related to this uh, emergence of novelty and order. And the understanding of God that comes out of this is a God who is more persuasive than coercive, that this isn't a God who intervenes to push things around. Uh, this is a God whose power is somewhat limited, and that, of course, runs a little bit against the tradition, but I think there are elements of it in the tradition. This is a God who pervades the world rather than intervening from outside. This makes the problem of evil a little more tractable because you're saying even God doesn't have the the power to intervene to dispel the evil. Even God doesn't know the future. So it's a God of love, a God of persuasion, more than a God of power. It sounds like it's a God who is like the senior partner with humanity in, in creating a future. This is right. Uh, God never is the only cause of an event. Uh, it's, it's always with the cooperation of the creatures so that there's always a, an interactive element even between God and the world. Some would say that that kind of God is a weaker God, is an imperfect kind of God. Well, uh, this, this is a God who is involved in the process and who perhaps suffers with the creation. And in, I think in the Christian tradition, the idea of the cross symbolizes a God who participates in the world's suffering feels the world's hurts and empowers it, gives it courage to persevere, but doesn't just immediately change the situation to, to dispel all suffering and evil. So that it's not a human God because this God is forever and this God does have resources beyond any finite creature, but it is a God who is more enmeshed in the process and is more vulnerable. I appreciate process theology because it forces me to reassess my metaphysics of what's fundamental. Are actions and events more primary than things and stuff? Is becoming more profound than being? I finally understand process theology, I think, but I still don't buy it. The God of process theology would be a smaller, limited God. Would I like that? I can't decide. I crave a radical alternative. Can I leap from one extreme to the other? <laughs> 
what would be the largest unlimited God? I ask philosopher John Leslie, co-editor of The Puzzle of Existence, Why Is There Anything at All? John claims that his God is the greatest possible God. I think a philosopher's duty would be to realize that the word God has been used in vast numbers of different ways. I think you should, for example, realize that the tradition of the West, that God is good, is not necessarily held everywhere. And in fact, that even in the West, there were people who thought that God had two sides, the good side and the evil side. So it will be modern Christianity, which is firmly in favor of the view that uh, God is to be associated with goodness. Even if you take that view, there could be all sorts of different ways of conceiving God. Some people who wanted God conceived extremely abstractly as a force of creative ethical requirement. The notion here is that God is not a person at all, that there is an ethical need for good things to come into existence, and God is simply the fact that this ethical need is itself able to bring about the good things, that there's no contradiction in the idea that ethical requirements can put themselves into effect. I find that a fully defensible view. I also tend to think that the first thing which an ethical requirement would bring about would be the existence of a divine mind which knew everything worth knowing. I myself go for the view that there exists an infinite number of divine minds, each of which knows everything worth knowing, because in this way we have a situation which is the best possible situation and is precisely what you'd expect a, a force of creative ethical requirement to create. Some people have thought that God is not concerned with the physical world at all, that um, God nonetheless attracts the world towards himself or itself. A lot of people who call themselves deists thought that God was very much concerned with how the universe would develop, but he did a really good job at the start, <laughs> so it was going to develop in good ways. And he had a principle of non-interference, because interfering would be interfering with the liberty of the beings he created. The God who wants people to do certain things, but in no way forces them to do well, them. Some definitions of God have an intentionality, mm -hmm. and some don't. But if we, if we don't have that intentionality, if we have a, 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 uh, an a priori ethical or force for goodness, why is then goodness some most fundamental thing? Goodness doesn't seem to be weighty enough. <laughs> well, I, I... Okay, you could think that goodness isn't weighty enough because it seems there's a lot of bad things going on in the universe. And um, therefore there's a problem for people who have this way of thinking. And they would tend to come back by saying, well, you can't have all good simultaneously. Some of them conflict with others, and that's the ultimate reason why there's a lot of bad in but the universe. But let's, let's take it the other way, though. Is goodness good enough to <laughs> cause the universe? The notion of goodness has the notion of requirement built into it. The good is that of which the existence is required in a particular way. Some people have Would argued you... that um, a god who knew everything, and who was all-powerful would be in some way the simplest possible sort of being. But what is really complicated is limitation. It's much easier to believe in an infinite universe than to believe in exactly 573 universes. <laughs> I myself believe that there exists an infinite number of minds, each of which knows everything worth knowing. We are part of the things known by one of these minds. An infinite number of infinite minds, one of which is the god of our universe? John, you burst my brain. I give you this, nothing conceivable could be bigger. You define forever the maximum possible state of reality. But reality does not march to our tune. <laughs> 
I try scanning all the diverse concepts of the divine, holding them all in my head at the same time. Do all these buzzing, confusing gods have anything in common? Are there core characteristics that unite them? I ask the former Regis Professor of Divinity at Oxford, Keith Ward. I think great traditions in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity get to God by thinking, what is the greatest conceivable being, being of greatest value, right. necessity and value. I think those right. are the two foundational ideals. When we talk about explanations yeah. in science, there are two basic sorts of explanations. Um, and one is what some people call nomological explanation, which is law-like, oh. law-like explanation. And those laws ultimately might trace back to something necessary, that you get some necessary laws, things have to be like that. So that sort of explanation could lead you to necessity. It's, it's possible. Uh, the other sort of explanation is what you use in psychology and the social sciences, what uh, you might call personal or value explanation, and that is you explain why something is the way it is because it exists in order to produce something of value. Mm. So any ultimate explanation of what there is, of the universe, would have to incorporate both those elements, necessity from the law-like explanation and value from the personal explanation. And so you get the idea, the hypothetical idea of the ultimate explanation, something that necessarily exists and is of the highest value and is therefore the goal of everything and the source of all values in the universe. And you don't need anything else, at least at that in initial foundation. No, uh, if this worked, it, it would be the ultimately elegant and economical <laughs> explanation of the universe. So, so this combination of, of uh, self-existence and value, uh, does that apply to a theistic, a deistic, monotheistic, polytheistic, in other words, all the different human varieties that have imagined or uh, experienced a, uh, a transcendence? Well, it's going to get you to one reality, uh, and, and since that reality is of supreme value, that's probably going to get you to a reality which is, has the maximal possible power, for example. So it's going to have no competitors along the line. <laughs> but it's what theologians in all the traditions have come up with as what would be the ultimate explanation, and that it's God. What, what is that thing or concept that God names? In the definition, I think there are two main elements. One is that God is the creator, uh, but that means that uh, God is other than everything that exists in space and time. God is beyond space and time. So straight away you're saying God is quite different in kind uh, from anything else. But the other element which is equally important is that, is that God is the most valuable or perfect or worthwhile possible thing. God is the good and the beautiful. And I think that's the tra traditional concept of God at its heart. There is an objectively existing good and beautiful, and it's perfect goodness, perfect beauty, and it's the source of everything that exists. God is necessarily what God is. And the attraction of necessity is that, uh, well, that explains why it has to be. But to get God in there, you've got to say, not only is it necessary, it's, it's maximally beautiful. And that's why it exists, for the sake of its beauty or for the sake of its goodness. Well, it's going to, get you to, one. to speak the word God is to invoke a spectrum of meanings, ranging from ethereal transcendence, God so far above human conception, to imminent pantheism, all the world right here is God. Ideas of the divine abound, Panentheism and process theology are just two of the myriad ways that humans try to imagine the creator of the cosmos. Panentheism seeks to combine the benefits of God is this world pantheism, which can harmonize God and science, with the spiritual need for divine transcendence. Process theology sees reality in terms of actions, not things, becoming, not being. On some days, I think, what is probably true of God 
if there is a God, is that all ideas of God are in some ways true. All concepts may count as descriptors of the divine. On other days, well, the diversity is dispiriting. Constructs of human strivings, expressions of human needs, nothing more. Which day is today? Which day is closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.